Um, uh, welcome back, everybody, to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens. This is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Uh, and this is going to be part six of our Bhadra Mayakara Sutra, the sutra on the Mayakara named Bhadra. Mayakara is a illusionist, I suppose. Maya, we know the word Maya, most of us know. This is that Sanskrit word for illusion. And then one who works with illusions, a Mayakara, is an illusionist. And this has been the story of the illusionist named Bhadra. Um, this is part six, so I'm not going to uh, repeat the whole story. Um, the basic idea is that this magician Bhadra challenged the Buddha to a kind of a magical competition of sorts. Um, essentially, Bhadra tried to trick the Buddha in order to gain reputation and fame, um, basically failing to do that and coming to this great realization of the Buddha, the Tathagata, of the Dharma. Um, Bhadra has a conversion experience. And I kind of mentioned this maybe around part two or so, I forget, but this is a sutra that very much falls into a, a genre of sutras or a class of sutras that are about conversion experiences, about people starting out as not being into Dharma, not into the Buddha, and then kind of coming to see the light. You know, and I know that that's kind of a expression that gets thrown around in English, at least, as it pertains to, well, a lot of things, but certainly religion and spirituality. But in this sutra, Bhadra literally saw the light, <laughs> like literally the Buddha was, was giving off light and he saw it. Um, and that was sort of the beginning of his conversion experience. Um, also, you know, mentioning part of the story are these multiple sites of enlightenment, Bodhi Manda or Bodhi Mandalas, um, areas of enlightenment. And I, I mentioned uh, maybe even in the first session or the second that this word that's being translated as, um, well, depending on the version you have, it might be site of enlightenment, it might be Bodhi Manda, but in the Chinese, which is the version that we're reading from uh, and kind of translating from in that way, the word is a Dao Zhang, which is kind of a uh, a field of the Tao, which is the Chinese way of thinking about this. But I mentioned that in part one or two, because the Chinese words uh, Tao Zhang. In Japanese, those two kanji, those two characters are dojo, like a dojo, like a karate dojo. Well, it didn't start as a karate dojo. <laughs> It actually began as a sanctuary, might be a word for it, a kind of even temples are called dojos. But what I want you to know is that that, in, that Japanese word dojo, which is now an English word, but that Japanese word dojo comes from the Chinese and it's a Chinese translation of this Buddhist Sanskrit idea of a Bodhi Manda or Bodhi Mandala, a site of enlightenment. And I'm mentioning this now because it's going to come up again a little bit later. So I just wanted that to be fresh in our minds, that that's what these multiple pavilions represent, um, because the magician Bhadra had manifested out of nothingness, had created a magical dojo, a magical Bodhi Manda, and invited the Buddha to come there. So after Bhadra's conversion experience, there's a Dharma feast. And that Dharma feast, which in terms of the story, we are to understand that, it, that they were having a feast. But in terms of the sutra, we, um, we the reader, the, the consumer of the text in that sense, we got a series of 10, actually 11 poems 
by five monks or arhats or shravakas, and then five bodhisattvas, and then a final kind of uh, dharma verse, gatha, a poem by the crown prince of the dharma, Manju Sri. Then that's when um, I forget what part it was that Bhadra launched into kind of a soliloquy of sorts, also in poetic verse, where he was sort of uh, lauding. Actually, he asks the Buddha a series of questions. He lauds the Buddha to, to a certain degree, but then he asks him a series of questions about the Bodhisattva path. The Buddha then responds with a poem, and that's what I read last time. Um, I had spent the week doing a fresh translation of it, and that's what I read from last time. And it's a beautiful poem. I tried really to do my best to translate it and to interpret it and all of that. But the one thing I didn't mention, it's, it's kind of what happens after that. And I didn't mention it for a reason because I think as usual, I was already uh, past time. It was already 8.30. And so I didn't want to start a whole new conversation. So I'm, this is picking right up where we left off last time. So right there, after the Buddha delivers this beautiful poem um, about how all dharmas are without existence, right? This is the idea of emptiness. Um, and because of this false discriminations or delusions arise because we think dharmas exist in an, in an inherent way, right? Um, he goes on to say the nature of causes and conditions are empty. We know this because they are apart from any fixed nature. Yeah. From this, you are able to fully know the pure dharma apart from such distinctions or delusions or defilements. And by means of a purified dharma eye, attain perception or see in that sense, the Tathagata or Tathagatas. So that was the end of the, the poem. And now when the magician heard those words, actually the whole poem of the Buddha, he attained the Anu Dharma Kashanti, the patience, what, what the, um, this, this English version translates as the patience of compliance with the Dharma. This is what he attained. And 5,000 sentient beings in the audience developed the mind of Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi and 200 bodhisattvas accomplished the patient endurance for the non-arising of all dharmas, the Anupatta Dharma Kashanti. Okay, so I'm going to pause there because that's what I didn't read. So after the Buddha says all of that, Bhajra attains this uh, patience of compliance with the Dharma, which I'm going to talk about in a second. Bunch of people in the audience develop the mind for Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi, complete unsurpassable enlightenment. And then 200 bodhisattvas develop, attain, or accomplish this patience, but it's a, this patience for the non-arising of all dharmas. I'm going to break those down because it's going to be helpful to understand where this is going. This is part of the conversion experience that I was referring to at the beginning. This sutra has a particular narrative framework. And it's a pretty kind of standard narrative framework when it comes to Mahayana Buddhist sutras, in particular, Mahayana Buddhist sutras that are in the Ratnakuta collection, this anthology of 49 sutras that we're reading from. A lot of them have this sort of narrative structure. And um, if you have the Chang, the Chang translation, he has a good footnote about this, which is that Bhajra goes through these three stages of development or what I've been calling conversion. 
The first one was that he attains this samadhi, a concentration, a kind of deep meditative state or realization, which is the what is the text calls the recollection of the Buddha, which is actually a, a term, a Sanskrit term called Buddha Nashmurti, or or in in Pali, I guess it would be something like Buddha Sati or something. I don't really uh, work much with Pali that way. But if you're familiar with sati, or in Sanskrit, it's called smrti, which in English, we call this mindfulness. But it's helpful to know that the word sati or smrti, it actually means to recall, to remember, to kind of bring to mind in that way. Mindfulness is key to the practice, but the word actually means remembrance. And so there's a practice or kind of a thing, and it happened to Bhadra a few, uh, few nights ago, where he kind of fell into this samadhi of the remembrance of the Buddha or the recollection of the Buddha or mindfulness of the Buddha. But it's kind of a wild thing because the idea is, is that he starts to see the Buddha everywhere. And that's kind of part of the... Mahayana type of conversion that Bhadra is going through, which is this idea of that originally he just saw the Buddha as a like a, a person, as that guy, that everybody likes that guy. And so if I can trick that guy, if I can convince that guy to come downtown to downtown Rajgriha to my fake uh, Bodhimanda, I can trick that guy. So Bhadra starts where we all might have started, which is thinking of the Buddha as a person who, who like is somewhere and you could go see him or something like that. Bhadra comes to this kind of Mahayana Buddhist realization that the Buddha is everywhere. The, body, the real body of the Buddha is everywhere in all things every, at all times. And I think... You know, that type of thing is tricky to just sort of start to explain. It kind of took, takes me a whole night, a whole hour and a half to get us to that point of understanding what it means to see the Buddha everywhere. So, you know, if you're, if you want to dive back into that idea of the Buddha Nasmurti Samadhi, the Samadhi of the recollection of the Buddhas, go back a couple of episodes here. So that was his first kind of uh, wake up moment or realization. The second is what just happened here, which is that he attains this Anudharma Kashanti. So we're gonna break that down. The key to this idea is that what Bhadra attains, what he gets, if you just wanna kind of put it in, in that kind of blunt English way, he gets this, it's a kashanti. So let's start with that. It's a type of kashanti. And of course, if you've been coming to Dharma doors or studying Dharma, you know that kashanti is the third of the six paramitas or the third of the 10 paramitas if you're counting up to 10. But it's the third of the practices of enlightenment. It's the third of the bodhisattva practices in that way. Kashanti. The root of that word is shanti. And if you know some Sanskrit, shanti means peace. Yeah, like there's a mantra, om shanti shanti, om shanti shanti, om peace, peace, right? So the root of this word kashanti is peace, but it's kashanti. And the basic idea of that Sanskrit word, in particular the way the Buddhists use it, is it is kind of like peacefulness. It is kind of the practice of shanti, of peace. Now, it's usually translated as patience. And I don't really mind translating it as patience because the root of the English word patience is peace, is paz, or, you know, from the, from the Romance languages from Latin for peace. So patience is fine, especially if you know the etymology of the word. So we're talking about patience and patience is the standard English uh, translation of Kashanti. So I tend to stick with standard English translations. 
but there's a certain kind of feeling to Kashanti. There's a certain thing about it. And yes, it's about peacefulness and tranquility and patience, but in particular, Kashanti is very much about equanimity and this kind of even keeledness in particular when it comes to getting angry or upset. That's like the main quality of practicing Kashanti is not getting worked up, not getting angry, not getting triggered would be the kind of modern 21st century way of putting it. So in modern 21st century English, we have this word trigger, like getting triggered, like something really rouses you up, gets you, you know, worked up in different ways. People get triggered differently in that way. What Kashanti is about is that not happening, the not, not giving rise to anger or being upset or things like that. But I want to be really clear about this, and I, I try to say this kind of every time I teach this. When we're talking about Kashanti, the practice of patience or Kashanti, and we're talking about not giving rise to anger, this is not a practice of repression and repressing anger. So the practice is not, oh, I'm getting angry. Oh, better hold that down as much as I can. That's not Kashanti at all. Kashanti is a paramita. Kashanti is right up there with pranya, right up there with wisdom. And so the real key to Kashanti is that it, the non-arising of anger in particular, it doesn't arise because one is wise. And what I mean by that is, you know, this is my, my kind of my standard teaching or my standard thing about Kashanti. It's kind of a form of, well, it's certainly a form of delusion, but it's kind of a form of magical thinking that says, it, the mentality that thinks, if I get angry enough, this will somehow translate to that person I'm angry at. And like, and they're going to like cry or they're going to feel bad or they're going to feel sorry. Like something good is going to come from this anger. That's delusional. It's delusional and it's a kind of magical thinking. It's actually right up there with the idea that if you wish for something hard enough, like you want something hard enough and wish for it, that you'll get it. You know, it's an interesting way of thinking that, oh, I could sit here and wish for this and I would get it. Or I could sit here and wish for this person, what, to, to die? Like, what are we talking about here, right? So my point is the Bodhisattva realizes that anger just eats themselves up and it never actually succeeds in going to the person that one wants it to. And so the idea here is, is that the Bodhisattva realizes, oh, this anger is not doing me or anybody any good. And so then the practice becomes working on that understanding, working on that peacefulness, that patience, but again, out of wisdom, not repression. Everybody feeling okay about Kushanti? Yeah, I've said a lot of that before. So now there's a couple of different types of kashanti. And, you know, there's the basic kashanti, which I just mentioned, which is basically about not getting, giving rise to anger. But what Bhadra attained is something called the Anudharma kashanti. The kashanti, the, the, the peaceful patience that, that jives with the Dharma that goes with the Dharma. They translate it as uh, the patience of compliance with the Dharma, but compliance is like, you know, 
I don't know that that conjures up ideas in my head, at least that I don't think are are part of this. There's a beautiful Chinese character, actually. I love the Chinese character for this, and it's very, it's a very flowy, watery character that speaks about kind of going with the flow in a way. So, uh, you know, that's this idea of anu, anu dharma, is like being in kind of like grooving with the dharma, being in line with the dharma. Now, you'll, re you'll notice that this is what bhajra attains. And I want to clarify what that means but I want to talk about the other two things that happened real quick, and then we'll get back to Bhadra's particular attainment. So it also says that 5,000 people, 5,000 people generated the mind of Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi. That's what this sutra has all kind of been about. It's, it's really a sutra that's about the, uh, what's called in Chinese, they call it uh, fa, this generating bringing forth. It's a really tricky word or idea actually to translate into English. And it's not that it's, it's not that it's like really complicated. It's just grammatically, we don't do English like this. Whereas Chinese, it's cool to do this idea of fa, like generating this mind, bringing forth this mind, cultivating this mind, all these English words really fall short of this idea because it's also sort of this aspiration in a, in, in a sort of sense. So all, is, all of that is wrapped up in this idea that 5,000 people after hearing the Buddha basically were like, I wanna, I wanna go for full, you know, supreme unsurpassable enlightenment. And I just, before we dive deeper into the sutra, I wanna clarify again, what is Anuttara Samyak Sambuddhi? What is supreme unsurpassable enlightenment? Well, this is what the Bodhisattva is cultivating. In fact, it's what makes a Bodhisattva a Bodhisattva and not a Arahat or a Shravaka, a practitioner of the Hinayana, the little vehicle. So Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi, Supreme Unsurpassable Enlightenment, is kind of in contrast to a type of enlightenment, a type of nirvana, that kind of was the goal, and in some senses is the goal, of early monastic Buddhism, right? What is kind of usually called the Hinayana, the Shravakayana, in the modern world, the Theravada tradition is the remnant of this school that sort of survives. But the basic idea of that early form of Buddhism was that one did the practice, one did the meditation, one practiced even Kshanti in that way, in order for one to get enlightened. That's the idea. The Buddha laid out this path to purify the defilements of the mind, to essentially stop producing kind of karma in a certain sense, and eventually enter into a nirvanic state of peaceful quiescence. That was it. And it's not to say that that's not still a part of Mahayana Buddhism in a way. However, the Bodhisattva path is a very different path because the aspiration is not to attain enlightenment and nirvana and freedom for oneself. It's actually to it for all sentient beings to attain enlightenment, all sentient beings to enter nirvana. That's kind of a different thing. <laughs> That's kind of a very different aspiration. In fact, a lot of the practice of the bodhisattva is intentionally about not trying to get one's self enlightened. But that's because in a way the Bodhisattva is working on this idea of self, on this sense of ego, 
and recognizing, and this is what the Mahayana tradition sort of recognizes, that a pursuit of enlightenment that is just interested in one's self can do a heck of a job of reinforcing the sense of self. That can really help with that. Now, it wasn't the point <laughs> necessarily, but the reality is, is that a lot of spiritual traditions become kind of self-helpy in a way that might be helpful for oneself, but again, this type of Buddhism, the Mahayana type of Buddhism, is, is it's what the Vietnamese Zen master Thich Nhat Hanh calls socially engaged Buddhism. This is not just a Buddhism for oneself in one's cave or whatever. This is a type of Buddhism that's about social engagement in that way. In particular, it's about uh, getting everybody enlightened. Again, this is kind of a different practice. And so these 500, sorry, 5,000 people who heard the Buddha's speech, when they were like, oh, they've generated or developed the mind for Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi, the idea is, is they basically understood the poem, understood the Buddha's message in that way, and were like, oh, yeah, I'm down. And that moment, the moment anyone, actually any sentient being, but the moment anyone makes the altruistic turning of the heart and says, you know what? Yeah, let's all get enlightened. Let, let's do it that way. The moment that altruistic turning of the heart happens, that is the generation for the Anuttara Samyaksam Bodhicitta, the mind of supreme unsurpassable enlightenment. That's what it takes, is just that altruistic outturning of the heart. Now, it's going to maybe take a while to then attain the kashanti that's in accord with the Dharma. And it might even take a little longer to achieve the patience for the non-arising of Dharmas, right? Because that's what those 200 bodhisattvas achieved. So those 200 other bodhisattvas, they had made the initial determination for enlightenment sometime before this. We are to understand that those 200 bodhisattvas had already achieved this anudharma kashanti, this uh, patience or peacefulness in accord with the dharma. But then after hearing the Buddha's speech, they developed this kind of most exalted form of kashanti called anupata dharma kashanti. The, that's a big one. It's a kashanti, so it's a type of patience, a type of peacefulness. But this is the anupata dharma kashanti. Anupata, if you are familiar with the phrase uh, pratitya sam udpata, dependent co-arising. If so, if you're familiar with that idea of pratitya samudpata, the co-arising part of it is uh, sam udpata. Sam, sam is actually a Sanskrit prefix, prefix, where it's where we get the English word same. S A M E comes from the Sanskrit pr pr uh, prefix S A A M, which means the same co-arising, arising the same. So if you're familiar with dependent co-arising, that's a type of uh, samudpata. This is anupata. Th there is no pata, and pata is birth or arising in that sense. So this is the patience, the kashanti, for the non-arising of dharmas. And that's another idea that I would probably just spend the next hour talking about, but we're not quite there yet. And so I want to, it's fortunately for me, Bajra didn't get that far yet. 
he only got to this compliance with the Dharma. And so I want to go back there for a second. The basic idea, and I, you know, I'm kind of going to just summarize this so we can get to the text, but the basic idea is the this exalted anupata dharma kashanti, this uh, patience for the non-arising of dharmas. This is like, you know, a really penetratingly deep understanding of that that teaching, the teaching of emptiness, basically. It's a very penetrating, deep understanding of that. And not only is it a complete understanding of it, but it's a kashanti. It's this kind of uh, quiet, tranquil peacefulness regarding that idea. So that's a very, you know, that's serious. What we're talking about now with just this Anudharma kashanti, just with the Dharma kashanti, you could kind of think of it as like, and again, I'm trying to put this in the context of a conversion experience. At this point, Bhadra is, is like, he doesn't fully get the Dharma, but he's down. <laughs> He's like, I'm down. Like, I don't fully understand, but this idea of like everybody getting enlightened and all of that, yeah, like I'm in. And that's kind of this moment of Anudharma Kashanti, this, this peacefulness or patience with the Dharma, but without quite un fully understanding it yet in that way. But you've sort of Caught, caught a whiff, so to speak, of its profundity or something like that. There's more I could say about this, but I actually think the sutra is going to kind of speak for itself at that, po at that point. So unless there's anything about those ideas. Yeah, Michael, I have a question, <laughs> yeah. but I don't want to get us uh, off track. Um, so can you talk a little bit about um, the desire of enlightenment to desire to get enlightened yeah that would be great thank you yeah the, i i <clears throat> i would definitely um i would definitely refer you to the fourth paramita the fourth paramita in our list of six is called virya usually translated as determination but i like to translate virya as drive, being driven. And it's a practice being driven in Buddhism, having drive, having determination. Some people translate this as forbearance, but it has more of this get up and go, energetic, motivating vibe to it. And I often like to talk about virya, determination or drive. I often like to talk about it in response to Connie's question about this idea of desiring to get enlightened, asp even aspiring in that way. As I understand it, and kind of what my studies have brought me to, is that the function or a, a function of virya is that it actually addresses that idea of, of desiring enlightenment. And the idea here is, is that the reason why I like to use the word drive is that especially if, if you, if any of you have ever been driven to do something, the general idea, at least how I use that word drive, the basic idea for me is there's kind of a sense that I couldn't imagine doing anything other than this because that's why I'm driven to do it. And it's kind of an end unto itself. And what I mean by that is, imagine you were driven, you had the drive, the get up and go to run five miles every morning. And somebody was like, oh, wow, you, uh, oh, the Olympics, you're going to the Olympics? You want to win the gold? And they're like, nah. And, oh, well, marathon, big, the big marathon's coming up. Nah, uh, you know, you, uh, you got an app. Are you competing with, with an app or something, trying to like win a, the high score or something? No, <laughs> no goal. 
I just get up in the morning. I can't imagine not running five miles. I'm driven to do it. It's like, I'm driven. <laughs> that's virya. And especially if we're talking about getting up and running five miles every morning, that's serious virya. But my point is, is that we know, I feel like, I hope, that we all know the feeling of being driven, where it is not goal-oriented, and there's a sense of, I couldn't imagine not doing it. That's why. The Bodhisattva seeks enlightenment, in my understanding, in exactly the same way, that they are driven to do so. It's not a goal. And there's a way in which just you couldn't imagine doing anything other than that. It wouldn't, it would like boggle the mind in that way. Sort of like our daily runner, where somebody's like, but dude, you could just lay in bed. <laughs> you could just keep laying in bed all morning. And the person who wants to go run five miles is like, yeah, I guess I could lay in bed all morning. I'm going to go run though. Somebody's sitting there to the Bodhisattva being like, yo, Bodhisattva, come back to the party. There's plenty to drink. Come on. It's fun. And the Bodhisattva's like, yeah, but I kind of don't want to. I'm driven in this other direction. And so, Connie, I, it actually is not me. It's the Buddha who even says, if enlightenment has been set up as a goal, then it's a desire like any other and just as delusional and faulty. It doesn't even matter if it's something like enlightenment and Buddhahood and all these things, if it has actually been objectified, objectified, turned into an object, turned into a goal. If enlightenment has been objectified and goalified, turned into a goal, that's not enlightenment. It's not what we're talking about. <laughs> That's a goal, <laughs> right? So that good, Connie? You feel okay about that? Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Any other questions about those ideas? Excellent. And so at that time, after the Bhagavan, the world honored one, had finished his food, Oh, yeah, there's a, okay. So uh, I think Noam put in, the, in the, the chat the link to the version I'm reading. This can be found online at a website site called uh, Lapis Lazuli, uh, lapislazulitexts.com. I really like this translation. Uh, it's much better than the Chang translation, I have to say. Um, so I'm using it. But there, I, I, Chang, I think, got it right. And it's kind of important, too. So if you have the one from Lapis Lazuli texts, they translate it as, at that time, after the World Honored One had finished his food, the magician Bajra then spoke Agatha. Chang has it that the world honored one speaks this gatha. And in my reading of the Chinese, it is the Buddha who says this. And I think that's really important for a few reasons. Let me read. So just be, let it be known. According to one translator, Bajra says this. According to two other translators, it's the Buddha who says this. But what is said, let's put it that way, what is said is, if one is able to regard the gift, the giver, and the receiver as equal and without division, then this giving is complete or perfect or perfect and complete. That's it. <laughs> That's it. The reason why I actually think it's like probably important to figure out who is exactly saying this, there's a way in which we've heard this before. This is what the 11 poems of the five monks and the five bodhisattvas and Manjushri, 
this was the gist of their poems. Um, if I were a betting person, I would bet that this little Gotha was the, the original core nugget of this, probably this whole sutra actually. And that the five monks were basically putting into their own words, this Gotha. And then the Bodhisattvas were putting into their own words, this Gotha. And then the whole sutra is very much about this Gotha. And so if you really wanted a quick, like a quick reference point for the Bodhisattva path, if you wanted a quick reminder of what it is, it's practicing giving without distinguishing the gift, the giver, and the recipient. Again, this really pertains to a lot of the remarks I made last week about a kind of more, well, a form of giving that doesn't do that, a kind of for, a form of giving that does distinguish gift from the giver, from the recipient is, well, it's not always that type of giving, but a lot of times when the gift, the giver and the recipient are understood as different, you can start to get this kind of pity problem where the person who's doing the giving is like the good, like, woo, way to go for you, way to go, giver. And the receiver is sort of like, like they should be humbled. They should be, you know, they're, oh, they're such poor person that needs to be given something. So then when there's that mode of giving, all of a sudden there's an elevation of the giver over the receiver, right? And then that's not even getting into the gift. Oh my gosh, the gift, right? I mean, how much are we talking here, right? Right? That's the problem with distinguishing the gift. It was, how big was it? How, you know, what was it worth? This and this and that. Oh, you just, you just gave them a kind word? You just said something nice to somebody? Well, what's that? What's that worth? <laughs> the idea here is, is that giving can come in a lot, a lot, a lot of different forms. And again, the Bodhisattva is kind of doing this mental training exercise of actually sort of not, uh, of, well, let me quote, as considering as equal, not distinguishing gift giver and recipient, right? Um, for me personally, I just want to share with you a personal like practice. It's not like, I don't want to say practice because I don't want to make it sound like I'm doing anything in that way, but I guess it's kind of a realization in that sense. I'm not saying that I'm all the way to truly be able to see as equal gift given and recipient. But again, for me personally, a huge stepping stone was that when I kind of realized that if I, if I think about it really carefully in a lot of situations, I would actually say this, uh, this opportunity that I get every Sunday night is a really uh, a good example of it where I don't actually know who's the giver and the receiver. And I'm not trying to sound all mystical or whatever. What I mean is I get so much out of these Sundays. I get so much from reading these sutras and, and preparing and learning that you're, you're the givers. I'm the receiver and the gift is truly the Dharma in that way. But again, I don't know who's giving what to whom in that way. And I, I, again, I feel like that's a stepping stone to truly obliterating notions of gift giver and recipient, but just kind of realizing, oh, wow, it's not really clear who's benefiting most from this situation in that sense. I think that that's sort of, um, you know, it's, related to this practice in that way. Okay. Um, all right, everybody good, everybody feeling good? Excellent. So that's the little, the Buddha's Gatha, maybe the magician Bhadra, but again, I think it was the Buddha who said that. 
So at that time, Ananda, the Buddha's young cousin, addressed the Buddha saying, world honored one, we wish that the Tathagata, by means of the spiritual power of the Buddha, would assist the magician Bhadra so that these various offerings and adornments would not disappear for seven days. At this time, the Tathagata, in accordance with the request of the assembly, caused the magician Bhadra's illusory transformations of the Bodhi Manda, of the dojo, of the site of enlightenment, to be gloriously adorned just as before for a full seven days. Um, I'm not going to go too into that idea of the magician Bhadra's um, uh, magically produced dojo remaining for seven days. Um, I guess I will just say, though, that it's my kind of reading of the text because it says in the very beginning that Bhadra went to the lowest, dirtiest place in Rajgriha and then magically kind of produced this gloriously adorned or beautifully adorned dojo. And then was like, hey, Buddha, come on over. And the trick, the trick that Bhadra had in mind was he was going to trick the Buddha to coming to the lowest, dirtiest place in Rajgriha. Now, only, of course, Bhadra's mind is so dualistically divided to think about the lowliest, dirtiest place in Rajgriha. Buddha, of course, equanimous in all ways, is not seeing things that way. So if you look at it that way, and if you were to read it as, you know, read the story a certain way, and this is just a possible interpretation, you could kind of imagine that Bhadra went to the lowest, lowest dirtiest place in Rajgriha and cleaned it up and like kind of made it pretty. And so they were saying to the Buddha, Buddha, can you kind of make this stay uh, adorned for seven days, make it last? And he does. There's probably a lot more to it than that, but I think that that's kind of one thing to think about, at least what's going on with the story of this. So, okay. So now we get into, well, let me, fi I'll, re I'll finish reading the narrative. So at that time, the Tathagata, along with the bhikshus and all the great bodhisattvas, as well as all the devas, nagas, yakshas, gandharavas, asuras, mahuragas, all of them surrounding him, he returned to Mount Gridrakuta, the vulture's peak. At that time, the magician again went to the Buddha, bowed, at his, bowed with his head at the Buddha's feet. He circumambulated the Buddha clockwise three times um, and moved back to one side. He then addressed the Buddha saying, world honored one, I wish that you would expound the path of the Bodhisattva, the way of the Bodhisattva, so that those who diligently cultivate it will quickly be able to arrive at the site of enlightenment, will quickly be able to arrive at the Bodhi Manda. The Buddha said, listen carefully and mindfully and I will tell you. The magician replied, just so world honored one, we, are, we joyfully wish to hear. And now the Buddha launches in to a list of fourfold teachings. So each of these are going to have four components. If you're reading from the Chang translation, you will be greatly disappointed <laughs> to learn that uh, Chang and company, they have translated, what, one, two, three, four, five, like six, seven, eight. I think they translate about 10 of these. 
I missed it the first time because I didn't have the lapis lazuli. So I was just reading this one. And, you know, I was going through and I noticed those darn ellipses. We've talked about the ellipses. So those four, three or four little dots, ellipses. So Chong and company, they love to just throw in some ellipses at you. And of course, you know, any, anybody familiar with typography in that way and, and punctuation, I guess, knows that ellipses imply something is missing. What of course is really frustrating about Chong is he doesn't tell you if it's a word, a sentence, paragraph, or pages upon pages upon pages of text. You, you have no idea, unless you speak Chinese and could get the Chinese version and be like, hey, wait a minute. There's 42 lists of four here. So it's another reason why the lapis lazuli text is a much better translation because they translate all 42 of these lists. Um, there's actually 43, but the 43rd one is a little different. It is a list of four, but it's a kind of a different list of four. And so I'm pretty intent on reading this as there being a list of 42 practices of the Dharma. And the reason why I say that is because is the number 42 is very significant to the type of Buddhism that is represented by this text, the type of Buddhism that's represented by the Ratnakuta collection, and the type of Buddhism that's kind of represented by this whole um, it's kind of really involved with the Avatamsaka Sutra, the Flower Garland Sutra. All of these sutras, the Malakirti, the Ratnakuta collection, Avatamsaka, and a few others, they're kind of a type of Buddhism all by itself. And it's, it has a lot to it, but one of the things is that they are very into the number 42. Uh, these kind of 42 stages of bodhisattva development, they're really into that. So I was actually kind of uh, very su uh, pleasantly surprised when I got out the, the lapis lazuli and I was like, wait a minute, there's 42 of these. So ta-da. Okay, so I'm not going to read all 42 of these. I debated about whether I, this would just be a recitation night and I would just read them but I feel like it would just leave everybody wondering or with questions. So I've selected about 10, um, I guess I've selected about 10 of my own that I really like that I'm gonna go through, but I strongly encourage you of course, to go to lapislazulitex.com, use the link and find the sutra and read them all if you're interested in the Bodhisattva path. Um, there's also kind of a, a bit of, it's not repetition actually, it, would, it will seem like repetition at first, but if you look carefully, it's not actually. Um, like in the early, well, I haven't even mentioned them yet, so I, I won't do that to you, but um, I just encourage you to read them all. So, okay. Um, and I'm just gonna start with the first one to give us a lay of the land, how these are gonna work. We'll go through the first one and then I might just start reading them because they're not like, only some of them are kind of even hard to understand what's even being said. Most of them there were very straightforward, uh, which is really great for those of us interested in the Bodhisattva path. So the Buddha said, there are four types of dharmas of this bodhisattva path. If one is able to cultivate them, then they will quickly arrive at the site of enlightenment, at the bodhimanda. What are these four? The first is to never fall back from the mind of enlightenment, from that aspiration for, for anuttara samyak sambodhi. So never to fall back from the aspiration for complete enlightenment. 
The second is to never abandon sentient beings. The third is to seek all good roots insatiably. And the fourth is to protect and maintain the correct dharma with great virya, with great drive, great determination. Okay, those are just the first four. So that's the first list of four. Um, the first thing that I wanna say, why four? So uh, I, this is an interpretive point. So this is Michael, this is me giving my interpretation. And it's one of those things where like I kind of started reading these and I was like, are they doing what I think they're doing? And then, you know, I go to the Chinese and I'm kind of reading the, the original words and I'm like, oh, they're doing what I think I, I think they're doing. So if you're familiar with On the Noble Eightfold Path, if you're familiar with the step of right effort, right? What is that? The sixth step on the path, I think. Yeah, right effort. Putting forth the right effort, there are four dharmas. There are four cons cons constitutive elements to the practice of right effort. Um, and they involve these dharmas, in particular, kushala and akushala dharma, these wholesome and unwholesome dharmas. And in particular, this, um, these efforts, they are about roots of goodness, kushala, these, uh, th these developing roots of goodness versus not good roots. And the analogy that's used to describe this fourfold practice, and I want to emphasize that, this original old school Shravakayana, Hinayana, early Buddhist practice, the fourfold practice of if you have good roots, you cultivate them and tend to them. If you have bad roots, anger, greed, don't attend to them, let them just be. Or if you don't have any good roots, Work on producing good roots, kindness, compassion, wisdom. Work on developing those. And if you don't have any anger, greed, delusion, or any of the bad dharmas, keep it that way. <laughs> Don't try not to let them go. Try not to let them give rise. Simple. Do good. Don't do bad. It's like, it's kind of simple, but... The idea is that if you kind of think of your mind as like a garden and there's these beautiful kind of flowers of kindness and compassion, and then these like weeds of anger, greed, then you just being a gardener of your mind and you're cultivating a beautiful garden mind full of beautiful flowers. If you want to weed covered, nasty, entangled mind, you, you could do that too. You know how to. You could tend to the anger. You could feed the anger with miracle grow. And you could completely neglect all kindness and compassion. If that's, if you want a mind like that, you could do it too. It's what I love about Buddhism. It's, it's about wisdom and saying, if you want this kind of life, this kind of mind, here, this is how you do it. You want this kind of life, that kind of mind, that's how you do that, your choice. And so there are these four full practices in the early school Buddhism that are about cultivating the mind that way. I would suggest that these are the bodhisattva version of the four full practice um, that the Buddha has like blown out into this giant list of 42 lists of four. The reason why I now say that is if we go back to these. So the first one is the first of this, the first list, the first of the four 
is to never fall back from the mind of enlightenment. And so that's that idea. It's kind of why I wanted to say all that at the beginning. When one comes to the realization that, you know, it'd be all right if I got enlightened, but it would be really great if everybody got enlightened, right? If one comes to that altruistic turning of the heart that I mentioned and is like, yeah, you know what? I think I'm gonna work on my kindness, my compassion. I'm gonna work on spreading the love. You've made the initial determination for enlightenment. The first step on the Bodhisattva path is to not <laughs> turn back, to not go back to like, you know what? Everybody's actually kind of a jerk. And so I'm going to be over here in my cave getting enlightened. That would be turning back, literally turning one's back on all sentient beings and being like, sorry, Mara wins. <laughs> you know where to find me. So step one on the Bodhisattva path is even though the tough, you know, it might, the tough might get going or whatever, you get going. You don't turn your back on the vow in that way. So that's the first one. The second one is to never abandon sentient beings. It goes right along with that. The first one is about the vow in that way. The second one is about literally not abandoning sentient beings. Simple. <laughs> the third one is to seek all good roots insatiably. And that's that reference to the original fourfold practice, which is about cultivating good roots. But the, the Bodhisattva cultivates good roots insatiably. Like again, driven, can't get enough good roots in that way. And when they're really, I mean, they were talking orchids, uh, all kinds of flowers going on. They're really cultivating that garden of the mind, right? And then the fourth, in this first list is to protect and maintain the correct dharma with great virya. Um, there's a lot I could say about that idea of the correct dharma. There's a certain way that it is, um, it's kind of actually talking about um, in a way like bad teachers and bad interpretations of the Dharma versus the real correct Dharma. And so the Bodhisattva is kind of zealous about guarding and protecting the real Dharma. You know, it, it kind of reminds me of I, I, a long time ago now, um, long time ago, uh, the nineties, it was the nineties. Uh, I, I went to Thailand for the first time and I was at one of the Wats, one of the Buddhist temples, and there was the big stupa kind of temple Wat thing in the middle. And it was surrounded by a little gate, you know, just a, like a decorative gate. And on all around the gate, there were these placards. And on the placards were quotes of the Buddha, mostly from the Dhammapada, right? That kind of um, that book of collected kind of sayings of the Buddha, you know, and so going around this, te the temple and reading them, it was like, oh yeah, you know, and things about karma and like, you know, basic Buddhist stuff that you would find. But then like every now and then there would be a quote attributed to the Buddha where I would be like, I don't really remember that sutta at all. And then I got to my favorite one where it said, time is money, the Buddha. And I was like, what sutra? Wait, wait, time out. When did the Buddha say time is money? But, you know, uh, you know, so I digress. But the idea, of course, is that that was some kind of cultural value that that temple was clearly trying to instill in the the people that came there. And so right along there with, you know, ideas about karma and doing good and all of that and attachment and suffering. And don't forget, time is money. 
I would not think that's the pure, correct, true Dharma. <laughs> okay. So I don't think a Bodhisattva has to worry about preserving that interpretation of the Buddha, but there's obviously a lot of other teachings of the Buddha that are the pure, correct Dharma, and the Bodhisattva zealously kind of tries to guard that and bring it into the future. So. All right, any questions about the first list of four? Yeah, Tanya. Well, it's, it's more just like um, the number 42, like why 42? It makes me think of like the, you know, Hitchhiker's uh, Guide to the Galaxy. <laughs> but, um, but I mean, is there something like, you know, significant mm -hmm. about that number? Is that the meaning of everything? I think I've never read the book, but my friend who read it is like always saying 40, he says 42 is the meaning of everything from the Guide to the Galaxy. I, I read that book a long time ago. And I, and I remember that the meaning of everything was a number. <laughs> um, if it's 42, that's, that's interesting. Um, the general idea of the, the 42 stages as they're called is there's actually four <clears throat> sets of 10. Uh, there's the 10, I'm not gonna get them in the right order. Uh, yeah, I'm not gonna get them in the right order, but it's like the four stages, the, or sorry, the 10 boomies, the 10 boomy stages, the 10 transferences of merit, the 10 abodes, and the 10, I forget what the first one is. It might be the 10 initiations of enlightenment. But anyways, there's four lists of 10. And then there's two additional stages, which, which are actually, if you don't, if, 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 you're, uh, if you're familiar with the 42 stages already, you'll find this interesting. The top two stages are, the uh, 41st stage is Samyak Sambodhi, and the highest is Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi. So it's where we get that idea of the highest stage is the 42nd stage. Um, so that's where the number comes from. Four sets of 10, and then two stages of completion, as it's called. And then and that's kind of carried over across all these sutras that you were mentioning. Yes. But the thing is, and the reason why I couldn't bring the list directly to mind is because different sutras have different lists of 42 things. There's some standards, but then there's also different sutras have different lists. And I actually don't think that that's like, well, A, it's not a problem, but B, I also don't think it's like, Buddhism's interesting. I've noticed this. I've never really talked about this or said this about all these lists. There's a lot of ways that where Buddhism has all these different lists but at least in the Mahayana tradition, there it seems pretty clear to me that they don't want you to get too hung up on these lists. And so every now and then they kind of just shift them around a little bit. And it almost seems intentional to me so that you one doesn't get too attached to a particular reading of it. So, yeah. All right, any other questions about the first list of 10? All right, well, so that all took a little longer than I thought, but that's okay. So let me read a few more. And if I feel like I need to stop or if anybody feels like I should stop, throw, do the hand thing or do whatever. Uh, I'm jumping down though, down to number four, the fourth one. Um, uh, for the Bodhisattva, there is also, oh, by the way, all of these, all 42 of these, are about a different aspect of the practice. They're not just, oh, and here's another list. Oh, and here's another list. So the first list was how to arrive quickly at the site of enlightenment. Uh, the second one, for example, is about uh, the actual practice of the four practices of the Bodhisattva. Um, the third one's a little tricky, which is why I'm skipping it. The fourth one is there are also four dharmas for the location of practice. 
So it's referring to the one up above, which was about the practices. And now this is the four dharmas for the, what it calls the station or the location of practice. Number one, the first is happily abiding in peaceful quietude. Number two, the second is to detest troubles and disputes. The third is to arise a mind of great compassion for sentient beings. And number four is to engage in various practices without the existence of coming and going. All right, so that's another list of four. The language is tricky. The word, you know, this idea of the location of practice, it's tricky because, you know, arising the mind of great compassion for all beings as a place of practice. I think we can understand what's being said there, right? So what I mean is, is that they're kind of referring to these as states of mind not necessarily geographical locations in that way. And so just again, the first is abiding in peaceful quietude. I think Chong did actually have a nice way of putting this one. Um, no, but sometimes they have a, a slightly better translation every now and then, but. Um, <clears throat> the second is to uh, detest is a little harsh, but avoid not being into uh, this idea of troubles and disputes. Avoiding the drama, <laughs> avoiding drama, right? Bodhisattva's just not into the drama, basically. Uh, the third is that one of um, being in a mind state that is having great compassion for all beings. And then the fourth is to engage in various practices without the existence of coming or going. And that one's a tricky one. Um, there's two different ways to understand that last one. And, you know, it could go either way, but I think I'm going to, um, I'll go with the one that kind of makes the most sense regarding stations of practice or locations of practice. So one of the things that's kind of being referenced with that particular word, station, or location in a way, it, it's important to know that in the world of Buddhism, all kinds of Buddhism, old school, new school, when one starts a mindfulness meditation, one might be in their room. One might be in their dojo, right? One might be in, in some place like that and the practice begins. But when one enters a jhana or a dhyana, when one enters one of these deeper formless meditations, the, the language that Buddhism uses is that you are now abiding in that first jhana. You're like, in a different location, what they would call a station. And then if you go to the second jhana, you are now in that station. Third, fourth, all the way into the samadhis, they all refer to those as stations. You're not in your room anymore, bodhisattva. You're in the second jhana. And it's not that you're in the second jhana in your room. You're in the second jhana. What this is talking about, that last one, which is really tricky. So the fourth is engaging in all of this, say, meditation practice, but without the idea of coming or going, without the idea of going into a dhyana, coming out of a samadhi, coming and going. This is related to that very deep, subtle practice of practicing giving without gift giver or recipient, 
This is very similar to that, but this is as it pertains to kind of meditation practice in that way. And so, again, if you just want a little uh, uh, Dharma shortcut, <laughs> the idea is it kind of goes back to what I was saying before about the early form of Buddhism. There's a way that when you're like, oh, dude, last night I made it into the third jhana. <laughs> There's a way in which, again, senses of self, ego, and all this stuff are being reinforced with that idea of I made it <laughs> to this place. Again, the bodhisattva path is predicated on this idea of emptiness. In particular, the emptiness of the self. The idea is, oh, look, I'm over here. Now I'm over here. Now I'm over here. Coming and going, coming and going. That's all part of the delusion of Michael <laughs> that's clinging to stuff that imagines this coming and going. The idea is, is that the self in that sense is never real. And so all of this meditation practice is, is about like, again, as a Dharma shortcut, the fourth jhana is speaking about how far you are from attachment to the sense of self. <laughs> so the idea here is, is it's not about you going to that. It's like, oh, my sense of self got less, less attached to sense of self. And so if you're, you know, if you've got your Dharma hat on, your thinking cap on, the idea here is, is like, oh yeah, then the practices should really be done without considering the ideas of coming or going, because we're kind of trying to overcome that way of thinking altogether. So, but again, that's a Dharma shortcut. There's a lot more to all of these. I'm just trying to, you know, give you a little something to go on if, if this is all kind of new to you. So, all right, um, we got time for one more and then I, I kind of need to, uh, I, uh, there's so many of these and actually, so I picked around 10 of these and I was gonna say, if I had read all 10 of the ones I chose, you might think that I only chose the ones that were about this socially engaged type of Buddhism that I'm um, extolling tonight, right? But actually all 42 are very wrapped up in the idea of, um, what was it? In the first one, it was about not abandoning all sentient beings. Um, I really wanted to read this one. Um, where is it? So number 14 in the list. So, and, and again, I, I wanted to really read these um, to really share with everyone, what is the Bodhisattva path? What is, what actually is this practice? Well, <laughs> number 14, the Buddha says, there are also these four Dharma practices for always being a friend to all sentient beings. What are the four? The first is to cause oneself to be able to wear the great armor of Kshanti. The second is to cause oneself to benefit sentient beings without seeking reward. The third is to cause oneself to not step back from the mind of great compassion. And the fourth is to cause oneself to not abandon others, even in the face of suffering and harm. Those are the four. That's a way to always be a friend to sentient beings. Always be practicing Kshanti, that peaceful patience, right? Amazing. Give without seeking rewards or benefit sentient beings without seeking reward. Excellent. 
never turning back from the mind of great compassion of Maha Karuna. And again, number four, to not abandon others, even in the face of suffering and harm. That's a pretty altruistic path, you know? And there's, there's so many more. And again, they are all so deeply focused on this socially engaged type of Buddhism, where it's about how to do this practice in society, in the world, with others in that way. And by the way, too, as these go down, they get more and more serious. But by serious, I mean that when you start to get down towards the bottom, the Bodhisattva is now making it a practice to, um, I mean, I wish I could just pull one, but is to basically now really start to develop mature sentient beings through education, what have you. But it's this idea of now it's not just about being patient, we're going to actually engage. And that's that idea of the social engagement in that way. So then finally, so the 40, let's see, the 41st one. So the 41st list of four is the Buddha says there are also four dharmas for entering into extremely profound meanings. What are the four? The first is to profoundly penetrate the dependent co-arising of all conditioned dharmas. That's number one. Number two is being able to correctly and fully know the underlying meaning. Number three, is giving rise to a profound and correct understanding of the nature of the Dharma. And number four is thoroughly penetrating the meaning of emptiness or the meaning of the emptiness of all Dharmas. That's the 41st level, right? That's like pretty, uh, yeah, it's, it's way more than just being friends with everybody in that way, right? Um, by the way, I want you to know too, so of those four practices, those four dharmas for um, profoundly penetrate, or sorry, for uh, extremely, understanding extremely profound meanings, the first one is understanding dependent origination. I mentioned that at the top, essential Buddhist idea, certainly for understanding profound meaning. The second one where it says, uh, being able to correctly and fully know the underlying meaning, that one might, you know, depending on, um, it, it, it was kind of cryptic to me, but the reference point for that, by the way, is a sutra called, hmm, I don't have it. There's a sutra called the Sutra on the explica Explication of the Underlying Meaning. It's called the Samdinir Mochana Sutra. That sutra is a very serious sutra. And basically, it's a really interesting idea about the implicit meaning to everything. Uh, and so the second practice here is to correctly and fully know the implicit or underlying meaning of the Dharma, I should specify. The third, giving rise to a profound and correct understanding of the nature of all dharmas. And then the fourth is the thorough penetrating, thoroughly penetrating the meaning of emptiness. So, you know, these are ideas we talk a lot about the dharma doors. So there's that. <clears throat> so just a quick note, the 43rd one. So I mentioned that there's 42, but then the 43rd one is it's about these uh, there are also these four dharmas of the paramitas. It's a whole other category. Um, and so I didn't address those. They're even deeper than the 41st one. So I'm not going to go into them. But again, this is a great outline of the kind of the, the width and the breadth 
of the Bodhisattva practice in that way. Okay, so just perfect timing. So after the Buddha had thusly spoken of the fourfold Dharma gates of a Bodhisattva, the magician Bhadra had the realization of the patience for the non-arising of all dharmas, <gasps> right? And he leapt with joy. He then ascended from the ground into the sky to the height of seven palm trees, which is what I've tried to capture here. At that time, so Bhadra elevates up to the height of seven palm trees upon attaining the patient, uh, the patience for the non-arising of all dharmas. At that time, the world honored one smiled, a bright and peaceful smile. And from his forehead released immeasurable light. This light universally illumined all Buddha realms and then entered back into the crown of the Buddha's head. At that time, the venerable Ananda thought, oh, the Tathagata, worthy and perfectly enlightened one, has not smiled this way without a reason. He then arose from his seat, bared his right shoulder, knelt with his right knee on the ground, joined his palms together, and then facing the Buddha, spoke this verse. <laughs> and that's where we're going to end it, which is the mystery of why did the Buddha smile? <laughs> and by the way, you might notice, if you zoom in really closely, I did give the Buddha a little smile with his radiating light. Um, and so, by the way, Ananda's poem is he's going to basically say, why is the Buddha smiling? Like, that's his, his, his poem. Um, I'll, I'll read it in its entirety next week. But that's where we're going to start, which is this uh, question of why is the Buddha smiling? I think this is kind of a, uh, an interesting point to leave it at. Um, yeah, so... Any questions, comments, answers, ideas? Excellent. Um, cool. So I'll be back next Sunday as usual. Uh, and I actually think we're probably going to finish it next week. Um, I'm not making any promises, but we kind of only have one more movement in the sutra. And so I might be appropriate since, uh, since the Buddha made Bhadra's magical Bodhimanda last for seven days, I figure I'll make the Bhadra magician last for seven sessions, right? So we'll see if that pans out. Um, otherwise, I'm going to turn it back over to Noam uh, for any 